got folks dialing, on, dialing in all the way from the far reaches of Kazakhstan right through to potentially the US as well. So it's truly a global call today. That's a testimony to kind of like um, the clients that we have and the, the reach that, that we've been able to achieve as a business, but it also sort of engages the, uh, the, the specter of being cut off at any one point. Um, it, would be, it wouldn't be a Zoom call if I wasn't cut off at least once. Um, right then, down to business or rather business agility, as you can see on the slide just in front of you. Um, we are going to talk to you today a little bit about how not to blow a billion dollars in energy and mining. Today, we've got an awesome panel from our valued clients, Chevron, BHP, and Tengiz Chevrolet. We've got Polly Mahapatra joining us from Perth in Western Australia. We've got John LeBlanc joining us from Melbourne in Victoria, Australia. We've also got Orurat Azjibanov from Atarao in Kazakhstan, who is from uh, TCO or Tengiz Chevrolet. And sorry, I neglected to mention that John is joining us from BHP. We're also joined from, sorry, excuse me, we're also joined by Chelsea Bates and Charles Tan, our managing directors and principals from our Melbourne and Singapore offices here at the. So the first cutoff has already happened. <laughs> so he's just saying that um, Chelsea and Charles will be will be joining us today and uh, to give a brief introduction on what business agility is all about. Right, Greg and I will be co-facilitating this, and while we're waiting for. Greg to come back to us and continue facilitating. We will be moving on to the first part of our agenda, which is the business ability, uh, agility introduction. All right, I'll be handing over to Charles and Chelsea to give us a brief introduction on what business agility is all about. Thank you, Andy. And uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for attending this session. And I, I'm, I'm very glad for the, having the privilege to speak to all of you today. In terms of business agility, the, the term there is pretty interesting because there is an ongoing trend where you see agile initiatives being led, not just from the technology space, but uh, by businesses in general. So, so hence why we call it business agility. And why might businesses contemplate adopting agile on a big scale? Very frequently, we hear our clients tell us three things. One of which is that many of the very large and successful organizations in the world are facing threats from very small, very nimble uh, competitors who are entering their space and disrupting them. So a lot of large companies are trying to work out how do they actually react in this new competitive environment. Secondly, many of our clients struggle in terms of it's less of an issue around the clarity of strategy, but more around what do we do to actually have strategy implemented down to the furthest reaches of our organization? And how do we stay in sync and not just have the, the CEO and his leadership team being clear about the strategy, but having the rest of the organization being able to join along in order to be able to deliver that strategy. Thirdly, frequently nowadays, uh, we all belong to organizations that want to be known as great places to work, where you know, we are able to attract the best talent. And one of the most important factors behind that is to be able to create a very engaging working environment. And Agile certainly is, um, is very useful in that regard. Now, moving on to the next slide, um, frequently you will find many organizations currently are adopting the waterfall approach to project management and questions might arise in terms of what is different about Agile. And we thought we would try to highlight these differences across four different dimensions that you see on the screen. The first of which is around business value. Now, if you were to think about the waterfall approach to implementing projects, business value tends to be achieved only towards the end of the project when you're about to go live, right? And that is when you are able to actually use whatever is the project or the outcome that you have designed. Agile turns it on its head using this concept called a minimal viable product where we try to encourage teams to, to come up with a subset, the very minimal subset of functionality that is able to deliver business value and try to, to come up with something that enables your customers or your users to provide comments and feedback early on in the process. As a consequence, the business value is enjoyed far, far earlier in that process. 
Moving on to the topic of risk, it is flipped around, right? So in terms of the waterfall process, if you think about you know, large systems, like for example, banking, core banking systems or in large capital projects, the risk tends to decrease only as you, you get very near to, to launching the project. That is when you actually know whether the thing is gonna work or not, what sort of functionality is available and you know, how usable it actually is, how usable the functionality is. In the same way for Agile, just because you're using the minimum viable uh, product concept, very early in the, the process, you will actually get a sense of whether is, that, is the initial idea workable or not workable. And if it's not workable, then what are the changes required in order for you to you know, make it workable and thus lower the risk substantially earlier on. Moving on to the third topic around visibility. In waterfall projects, you get great visibility when you're defining the requirements and you get great visibility when you're about to launch. But during the stages where you go through the, the design phase, the development phase, the, the, the testing phase, you don't really have that much visibility over what is going on. So frequently people will say, my team is working in a black box. You know, they are now deep in, in development phase and therefore I need to leave them alone for a couple of months, right? Whereas in Agile, uh, through using instruments such as the springboards, you know, the showcase uh, ceremonies, you get pretty good visibility about what's going on throughout the life of that project. And then lastly, in terms of adaptability, with uh, traditional waterfall projects, particularly in very large projects, you often hear people say, well, I get 50 people into a room, I get a couple of thousand requirements, then I get 15 signatures from all the big bosses that this is what we want to do, and then we launch and, and we, we go on the project. And once that document is signed by those 15 people, it's written in stone. If you want any changes, you need a project change request, otherwise nothing changes. So therefore, um, the adaptability is pretty low in that regard. Whereas for Agile, um, being able to change requirements, particularly almost on the fly, is a hallmark of Agile practices where it's okay to abandon the project if it's no longer feasible and where new requirements can be integrated into the requirements relatively easily. Now, so throughout this session, I've been um, mentioning a lot about minimum viable product and you might be wondering, how does this concept actually work, particularly in the capital project space, which is a terrific segue to, to what my colleague Chelsea Bates is going to tell you about. And Ch Chelsea? Thanks very much, Charles. So a big part of um, the minimum viable product is iterative delivery. And so you'll hear the word iterative often when people are talking about business agility, but how does that really work and what does that actually mean? So an iterative approach helps ensure success by providing, as Charles referred to before, feedback early and often. So if we look at that top row, a traditional way of working. If I was to ask you, and I can't ask you because you can't answer at the moment, but if the very first piece, that was three months and you're giving me an update on how what the team was doing was going, is it green, red, or amber? I'm probably going to say green because I've actually got no idea. All I can see is a thin slither across the bottom. But then to come back, you know, six months in and say, well, how are we going? Are we on track? Again, probably have no idea because I can see a little bit more, but I'm not sure what the outcome is or what we're trying to get to. So I'd say, yeah, probably looking great. It's green. Three months further down, we're now nine months in. This is probably not looking too great. So I might flag it as amber. I don't know if we're going to get there. It's looking like it might go a bit pear-shaped. And then 12 months in, and this is what's delivered, we haven't met the brief. This is not a very good Mona Lisa. Um, so it's only flagged red when we've worked out we haven't delivered the outcome. If we looked at an agile way of working, we might start off with a high level sketch, you know, just a really rough picture of what this looks like. We go and get some feedback. Um, you know, yeah, it kind of looks what I'm looking for. Maybe can you add some color? Again, black and white doesn't really give it me the, um, the outcome I'm looking for. So we add some color, we go and get more feedback. Actually, I want some more contours. We add some contours. We go and get more feedback. Actually, can you make, you know, improve the resolution? By working this way with that constant iteration, that constant um, getting feedback to refine what we're doing, we end up with the right outcome. One of the things I always hear, uh, pretty much most clients, oh, no, no, what I'm doing, too risky, highly risky. Agile would not work for what I'm doing. No, I'm working in strategy, definitely couldn't use this, or I'm in policy, I'm in government. Um, my question, my challenge to my clients is always, Okay, let's think it back if, you know, 1600s and the king, and I'm a painter and the king had come to me and said, can you paint a portrait of my wife? It's a, our 50th wedding anniversary. It's very, very important. 
if I went along and delivered the top line, what do you think would happen to me if I presented that 12 months at the, you know, the big coronation or the, you know, where he presents this to his wife? She'd be furious. He'd be furious at me. She's like, do you think I look like that? And I'd probably literally lose my head because it was 1600s. If instead I'd worked with the king and, you know, every couple of months or, you know, here's where I'm at and he could say, mm, no, that doesn't quite look like her. No, you know, she, she wants to you know, show her collarbones or whatever feedback I'd have, I'd iterate that and keep delivering it. And the other question or the other challenge I often get when we talk to clients about business agility is, oh, no, what we're working on is very, very high cost. We'll get into that a little bit more today with our guests. But from a cost perspective, the cost of changing, if I kept iterating and taking that feedback, the cost of changing and making small changes is significantly less than the cost of doing something for 12 months and then finding out I didn't reach the outcome I was looking for. So when we talk about iterative, it's that sort of adding just enough and getting feedback so we can keep moving on. Now let's move on. And what does this actually mean in business? So we're going to talk about this from two different perspectives. Um, there's what does it mean in capital projects? Obviously, today is about you know business agility within energy, mining, oil and gas. And so if we think about capital projects in their early phase, that sketch is where we sort of understand the opportunity. So we outline a set of opportunities and we start to assess likely approaches across each of them. And we're, quick, we're very quickly developing that strongest case. Adding more colour, it's when we start to select and define the concept. We start to understand the constraints of the project. We start to identify key focal areas to investigate. And we start to look at prioritisation and trade-offs. The contours is when we actually define the project. So we develop a detailed strategy a, um, using probably Scrum. And then the resolution is where we delivery of the agreed project. So we complete the assessment and begin the project detail design. And we'd probably here switch to Kahanban. So that's from a capital projects phase. And then so we're talking today about business agility. So say we're in a corporate function, uh, a strategy. I, you know, I'm tasked with coming up with a strategy document. So my sketch could purely be an outline of the headings within the strategy document. Strategy people love PowerPoint. So it could literally just be the headings on each slide. No more detail than that, but here is the skeleton of what it looks like. The colour is where we might start to add the key point for each heading to provide context. What does that heading mean? The contours is where we start to provide maybe the, you know, the top five talking points to provide more context. So it's not written beautifully, but we're starting to get an idea and fleshing it out. And then the resolution is that detailed content completed for each section and refined. So moving on. Back to Greg. Thanks, Chelsea. I've had introductions. Great. It's the uh, point at which I was cut off, won the sweepstake. So congratulations there. Um, thanks, Chelsea. Thanks, Charles. And apologies for being cut just then. So let's just have a look at who we've got on our special guests for today and some introductions for them. So first up, it's Polly Mahapatra. Polly was a finalist and nominee for the Western Australia 40 Under 40 in 2021. Additionally, she was a finalist for the Western Australia Chamber of Minerals and Energy's Outstanding Young Women in Resources. She gained a first class degree from the University of Western Australia, followed by a master's in commercial and resource law. Polly is a systems completion engineer for Gorgon Stage 2 and a decision making advisor for capital projects at Chevron. John LeBlanc joined John gained a BBA from Baylor University, followed by experience in Deloitte, KPMG, and Caterpillar. At BHP, John has led several key initiatives working across Asia, Australia, and the US in a range of functions, including oil and gas, marketing and finance, and business transformation. John ran the delivery for the world-class functions, which transformed how BHP delivers across a number of different business functions. And this was supported by Adaptivate and BCG. John is currently Head of Enterprise Improvement at BHP. Oirat Azberjanov is the recipient of the prestigious President's Scholarship. Oirat gained a degree from Newcastle University in the UK, where I didn't manage to get in and is fantastic for a night out, so I'm told. He has co-founded a, a coding school for kids aged 6 to 16, and with Tengiz Cheverol, Oirat has been a significant leader in a recent major transformation, reviewing the way in which the $6 billion enterprise works. He has worked in operations, capital projects, and strategy and planning, and Oirat is currently the head of decision-making center of excellence for TCO. On to our first question. The first question is, what does business agility mean to you? And I'm going to go to Polly first. Thanks, Greg. Um, that was a lovely introduction. And I'm very privileged to be in the presence of such great co-panelists. Um, business agility in 
kind of its simplest form is the ability for any organization to adapt. Um, it's especially for oil and gas or even traditional resource organizations, the ability to adapt and the ability to react to changing circumstances external to us is becoming increasingly more and more important. Um, so business agility in that context is our ability to respond and react appropriately to our changing um, market conditions. Thanks, Polly. John, how about yourself? What does business agility mean to you? Yeah, thanks for thanks for inviting me. And I agree, um, such great uh, accolades across the across the panelists here. So I'll do my best to live up to the title of this thing, which is pretty audacious. Uh, how not to blow a billion dollars. But um, look, business agility to me is all about outcomes over process. It's it's about a culture in which people feel empowered to make decisions and work together collaboratively to get the right outcome for customers. So for me, you know, business agility is probably easier easier to identify when you don't have it. <laughs> it's probably easier to see when you have slow decision making, you require a lot of approvals, uh, and you've got grumpy employees who are feeling disempowered. Uh, you've got complaints on transparency from customers. Generally, these are pretty good signs that you're lacking business agility. And so um, certainly you can influence business agility through processes and, and the things that Charles and, and, and Chelsea spoke about earlier today. Uh, but for me, it, 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 a lot of it boils down to the culture of your organization. And, and it shows up in what you promote. It shows up in the things that you reward. And, and in many times it shows up in the things that you're somewhat apathetic to and you kind of let slide. So uh, business agility to me is as much of a culture thing and a leadership thing as it is about the processes or things that you have you have in your organization. Awesome, awesome. Pretty big thing there. Um, Oirat, yourself, what do you think about business agility? What does it mean to you? Thank you, Greg. And thanks, Dr. Team, for inviting. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm also super excited to be here today. And and it's my privilege to share my experience with the audience today. I agree with Polly and John's answers. So probably my answer would be a combination of both of those. Well, I can talk about it all day long, to be honest, uh, but I'll try to be short here. So business agility for us is to win in any environment. Um, and it is enabled through culture and behaviors, especially from leaders actually, um, who build these empowered, high-performing teams um, that deliver value and continuously improve the uh, company's performance. And it's about having a growth mindset. Um, and, and this mindset should be uh, exhibited across, I think, all levels in the organization. So that, that would be my short answer to that. Awesome, awesome. Any further comments? Otherwise, we will move on to our next question. Excellent stuff. Our next question then is, could you share the impact that you've seen when adopting business agility? And this time I'll go to John first. Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, look, for the better part of three years, <clears throat> you know, I ran or and, and look for the purposes of I ran, fortunately I'm the only BHP person on the panel, so I get to take credit for the, the full program of work. There was a host of others uh, that really helped out here, but we ran an, a large scale transformation of our corporate functions and, and that was off the back of multiple years of, of globalization and then organic growth and development of the functions. But you know what we were hearing quite quite a lot was that customers were were, were sort of lacking satisfaction and transparency, cost, service, all the all all those things that that you hear customers um, you know have complaints about. And so, for me, um, you know, deciding to run that program under an agile banner, and I, I won't say that it was purest agile because I, I, I really strongly disagree that you can just pick up the process and deploy it anywhere, uh, you know, purely. But um, for us to, to make that was, was pretty much because we knew that the, the outcomes weren't exactly clear of what we were going for. We had a high vision, but we didn't know exactly how to get there. Um, the ecosystem in which we were organizing and working was was complex. It, it was complicated, but it was also very complex because the work that an HR team does for a customer and a finance team and an EEA team, they are all interwoven. We all work in organizations like that and understand how foundational those support functions are for an organization's success. And then how we, get, how we would get there, we didn't know either because we were looking at sequencing for value as opposed to sequencing for just a, a process and steps. So, so what we found though is, is that um, that we were able to pivot the program quite quickly um, by working 
in a planning cycle of what we knew versus what we might know and we're going to plan really in depth the long-term Gantt chart of three years of a transformation program that honestly took 100 turns from the day we started so for me the impact that i saw was our ability to pivot quickly our ability to focus on what was important at the time and not focus on the things that we didn't know three months down the road which might actually cause us some concerning concerns so um, we had great success on that, and, I, and I'm quite uh, pleased with how we were able to actually even accelerate the program. You know, le new leadership came in. We were able to cut a four-year program to a three-year program by actually focusing in on planning and acceleration through the agile routines that we did have in place. Not perfect, not purest of form, but for us, that's what business agility had as an impact for, for our transformation. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for that, John. All right, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I just want to echo on what John said. I think the agility brings the clarity and on prioritization what needs to be done first. Oh no, we have our second casualty. That's a, yep, second another one bites the dust. Aha. That's all right. You're back? There we go. All right, please go ahead. Am I back? So, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, to answer this question, I, 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 I'd want to start here with a bit of a history on how Agile was adopted in TCO. Uh, so I may not surprise you if I tell that the first adopters in, in, the, in our company were IT folks, as Agile came from software development, uh, right? So back in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, IT were the first in TCO to try and pilot. And today they transformed their entire operating model to agile and now they're using a scaled agile framework which is also safe to deliver their products so also back in 2009 agile application in non-at functions and we started with capital projects so up uh, until end of 2019 we had multiple scattered uh, pilots across the organization that brought that run both it and non-at projects then we realized that, that in order to scale Agile in the right way, we need to have a center of excellence that would be some sort of, you know, a glue or a knowledge hub for, for Agile in TCO. And that's how our team was created. Well, we've held many discussions on where they see who should be placed. Um, IT folks as early adopters had a good argument since it started from IT, then the COE should be a part of uh, their team. But they, uh, they didn't know how to apply it in, in non-IT projects. So at the end of the day, the decision was made that this COE should be part of strategic planning team. And we employed the IT and non-IT agile adopters there. So the decision compromised everyone. So coming back to the question on impact, um, as a center of excellence, one of our responsibilities is to assess the agile matu maturity and do surveys for the teams that we support. So we've seen thus far from those surveys is that the agility increased the employee engagement. And there are several factors uh, probably that, that can explain this, like um, developing the sense of autonomy or mastery of what they do and purpose. Employees feel valid when they see a broader thing, uh, broader picture, uh, broader perspective of things. Um, so they were not like uh, simple doers that come and uh, that come to work and run the wheel, but they feel part of a team that has a mission. So, and we think this employee engagement also led to improvement in um, operational performance. Um, the, um, and uh, we see a decrease in cycle times. So that's a part of operational performance with uh, this speed of delivery. And, and guess what? The, the increase in speed delivery had also led to increase in customer satisfaction because uh, our customers get the value quicker. And um, I guess these are three main impacts that we observed thus far, employee engagement, operational performance, and customer satisfaction. That's awesome. Thank you, Ariat. Polly, impacts of business agility. Tell us a story. Yeah, so I mean, without just regurgitating what John and Orat have already mentioned, which I think covers off on, on a large part, I can just, you know, echo the same sentiment. Um, some of the more surprising impacts I think I saw of business agility were just the sheer, like, percentage improvement in tangible metrics. That was really impressive to me. We were looking at 
you know, 35% cost improvements on multi-billion dollar projects. And that, you know, while you, you can't probably put all of that on just agility in and of itself, but it's that combination of increased transparency, increased accountability and employee engagement that adds to the kind of significant changes in, in how you're able to improve and accelerate your capital project delivery. It was pretty impressive for me, honestly. I, I didn't think that it would have that significant of an impact, um, but I was pleasantly surprised. I think when we heard about the numbers on, I think it's the project that you were referring to, I think we were all a bit kind of pleasantly surprised, to be honest there, Polly, that was uh, pretty exciting. Hey, I just want to do an extra level of detail. I mean, we're talking here about the impact of Agile and how Agile itself can be flexible. And John, I just wanted to draw you on the experience that you had, I think, way back when, I think it was in early 2019, when we were at uh, BHP, um, the switch between different Agile styles, so Kanban and Scrum, I wanted yeah. to you just sort of share a little on that. Yeah, and you know, we heard early on, and I think it goes to, and I'm, I'm interested in ORAP sort of view around, you know, obviously it seems very obvious that Agile just starts in your technology center, right? I mean, it's just it's a kind of an obvious one. It's where it was born, right? But if you really go back further than that, it wasn't just from technology. It has its roots in lean and it has its roots in, in a lot of non-technology places, yet it sort of got its prolific status through the, you know, through the Agile framework. But um, so, so because of that, I, I, you know, in my experience, it's been very, very easy to flip back and forth because in a, in a transformation program and kind of talking about, I think Chelsea raised that what you're doing in a pre phase from a capital program, you know, you have the ability to diverge and converge on design quite quickly and without much regret. When you start actually put laying concrete, you've got a bit of, bit of a bit of a problem if you want to change at that point. But in corporate functions, I think, in, at least in our transformation space, you know, we, we entered in and out of periods of time where we were going through areas where we just kind of, we, could, we, we knew what to do, right? And so it needed to be more Kanban, it needed to be more process-based, best practice, you know, cut cycle times down and get the work done. Um, but at times you were going through areas where you're like, well, actually we've encountered a problem here. We actually don't know how to solve it. So we kind of had to go back to the sprint cycle and think, okay, let's go back to it and look at it. And so being less rigid, uh, being focused on the principles rather than the process. And, and it's funny, you've got to use the process to get you to a mindset and get you to work in that way. But once you kind of get it, and there is a flip at some point, you kind of get it, you can go in and out of it quite quickly and, and, and adapt and, and, and choose the right tool for the right problem. Because it's not always that business agility from an agile sense is going to be achieved through sprint. Uh, it very well could be achieved through Kanban. It very well could be achieved through, you know, you make it up. I don't, you, whatever. But, but as long as you're fixed, fixated on the outcome, I think that's what mattered most. And but what that required was it did require a routine to where leaders were talking quite a lot. Like we were talking quite a bit about what are we going to do next? What's the best approach? We had weekly meetings in terms of do we pivot here? Do we pivot there? Um, which gets into sort of one of my surprises. I know that's the next question, Greg, but around the level of planning required to actually achieve business agility and the frequency of planning. You need to choose the right frequency of planning for the problem that you're getting to, not necessarily planning more or planning harder. It's more about the frequency in which you need to look at that. But that, that was my experience uh, in this. And I don't know ORAP or others, I guess, maybe drawing on that from the tech birth of this to applying it elsewhere. I'm not sure if you experienced other, other examples like that. I think just to kind of build upon what John was saying, you have to be agile in your deployment of agile. So I, I know it's not, like it's not counterintuitive, yeah. just like be flexible yeah, exactly. when you're trying to deploy agile and use the parts of it yeah. that work best. Um, on a capital project, for example, it's very similar. It's like when you're at the initial kind of phase one, phase two, where you're still defining the concept, you're looking at your opportunity, you're considering your different portfolio of options, Scrum is really applicable because you, you have a lot of ambiguity, you've got a lot of risk. We've also got a lot of value to create at that early end of the project. Once you've kind of selected your concept, you know what you have to go out there and deliver. It's kind of like, just go and do the work. Kanban is definitely more appropriate. And in, in Perth, at, with the Chevron Australian Business Unit, we've tried both and in the capital project space and on different um, phases of different capital projects. And they both worked really well. And that's not to say that one is more effective than the other necessarily. 
you know, I've seen schedule optimizations in phase four using predominantly Kanban, so not even Scrum, it's an already in-flight executing project. And we've still seen optimizations, you know, of the scale of, we were going to deliver something in eight months time, but with a dedicated team, agile team, working predominantly in a Kanban style approach, we've accelerated that down to four weeks to produce the same amount of deliverables. So like I said, it's it's pretty astronomical what you can achieve with this way of working. Um, that, and it can be applied differently depending on what phase of a major capital project you're actually working in. Yeah, to build on, to build on what um, Paul and John just said, we are, we are even applying Scrum in um, our business plan development. Uh, we are applying Kanban in our, our strategy sourcing. We are applying Scrum uh, in strategy development. So you shouldn't be trapped by the processes, but I love the comment from Paul. You, ha you have to be agile when you're using agile. Just, just well said. I think one of the things that I've been delighted to see in working with all three of you, as lucky as I have to be uh, to, to have done so, is how, if you'll forgive the uh, inflection given where we are in the world at the moment, how infectious the uh, the approach is. It's, um, it's, it, it gets places pretty quickly, right? Perhaps I'll move us on to our third question today. Um, what were the surprises that you encountered? And maybe I'll go to Oirat first, please. Yeah, I guess it was the acceptance. Um, we have very... Um, conservative company, a conservative industry, but now Agile is probably one of the most popular words in the organization. Everyone wants to practice it and be coached on how to be Agile. And it was like um, an eye opener for, uh, for, for some certain functions in the organization. And as a center of excellence, we also built fluency among um, our employees on Agile. So these trainings are I think they are the most popular one in the company. The classes get full in hours once the schedule is published. So that's something that excites me as a agile proponent in Tengi Shoro. Thanks, for that excellent answer there. Can I go to Polly next, please? What surprised you about agile? Similar to what Laura is saying, it's just the, I think it's the resistance to change is what surprised me because I think once you've tried it, and once you've seen what Agile can do for you, it's a no brainer that this is the way that you wanna work. It's totally a no brainer. But then when you take that process to someone who's never tried it before, and you're like, yeah, like, look at this thing, this is so great, can we do it? And they're like, no, I don't have time. I don't have time in my schedule to you know, accommodate this new way of working. That yeah. resistance, that initial resistance to overcome that, that was quite surprising to me. I was like, hey, this is going to actually give you more time in your schedule. Um, just tr give it a shot. Um, I guess in, in kind of the more legacy parts of our um, corporation, it's really hard to get that traction. And that, that was surprising to me. John, it's yourself. Yeah, so um, look, to ec I echo the two, I mean, uh, to a story, that, a quick story. So I, we did agile trainings across the organization when we were running out the program of work, everything from, you know, doing the Lego game, which if you've done it, you understand what it is, is really fun, like, but it's like a, it's like a three hour, two hour exercise of like building a Lego town with not enough resources, not enough time, not enough direction. And so you, you, you literally live the entire agile cycle in a span of two hours and it's pretty cool because you see people's minds flip like at halfway through going, oh, wow, like what I thought was a product actually can be something quite different. Because if I really clarify with the customer what they really need versus what I think they need based off of my experience, actually I could, I could solve that with this like that, just a conversation or a, a shoe on the table as opposed to a built thing. Anyway, that's, a, that's an in, internal example. But I ran that with, uh, I actually ran a version of our agile game with the petroleum leadership team that we have in Houston uh, and it was very interesting to talk about legacy operations and people working in a very specific way to actually get them to start thinking differently about solving problems. And, and, and it was um, it was eye opening, I guess, in terms of this. It's not rocket science, to be honest with you. And in a lot of ways, it's just good leadership and it's just good management. But what it does is it gives you the tools and the ability to actually codify that a bit. And so while I, I do I do rag on process a bit because I do still think we need to always focus on outcome. The process is actually a mechanism for you to actually get 
to what you to get to that mindset. And once you get to that mindset, then you can you can really advance in your practice. But I do think maybe what surprised me the most is the MVP concept and how hard that is from traditional leadership to actually get that across. People expect, I think, in traditional leadership to get the shiny product that they want, and they're going to almost expect to tell you why that product doesn't work, and they kind of expect you to go back and reiterate that full product again. This concept of working in MVPs is a very uncomfortable one for a lot of people. Um, and, and actually, but when you start to get them to the point that you can actually, like, I could spend six weeks and design what I think you want. Um, and come back to you with a product. And I know you're going to tell me to go away and take another six weeks, or I could spend two weeks, draft you what I think it is on a piece of paper, put it in front of you and ask for feedback. You know, wow, that's actually an empowering way of working. So I think it's just, maybe it's more around that, that concept of what surprised me was the resistance at times, but then once it clicks, it's like, yeah, okay, this makes a lot of sense. And there's a lot of acceptance and groundswell and creation of, 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 of good, good ways of working that you hadn't even thought of either and, and being agile in your agile approach as Polly had mentioned. And just adding to John's point, uh, as one of those people who actually conduct those Lego sessions, I can't tell you enough how many times um, it surprises people when they realize that they can actually produce more through collaborating instead of competing right. with their colleagues. That's right. And actually talking to people across the table from them. And, and, and you realize like in that, in that microcosm of the moment, we don't actually talk to our customers and actually ask them what they want. And how empowering is that moment to actually just give them a call and say, I heard you need this. What exactly is it that you need? There are a lot of little examples like that, that I think people, you know, you can deploy a full agile transformation program and hire a bunch of people to do that, in which I would highly recommend Adaptivate. So there's my plug for you. But the point is you can walk away from this really saying, you know, tomorrow, have I talked to my customer in the last couple of weeks and maybe just pick up a phone and call them? Awesome stuff. A lot, of, a lot of stuff to discuss there. Look, we're, we're really getting through it and the, uh, the discussion is really rich here. I don't want to kind of terminate the discussion too much, but I would like to move us on to the next question, which is, what were the key reasons that your organization decided to start on this agile journey? And you can be as candid and as uh, kind of glib as you wish in answering this. And I'll go to John first. So I, look, I, I'll take a slight detour on answering this, but I think because I think I answered the organization question, our, our problems were uncertain. We didn't know how to get there uh, and, and we needed to have high engagement early on. And so I think for those sort of key agile tenants, like we, we chose to go down this route of running our transformation that way. What I kind of would maybe pivot to, sorry, Greg, take a little bit of liberty here, is, is sort of what I, why I went on the journey personally. Because as a leader um, and as a new leader, early in career leader, um, it was really clear to me as we, were, as we were sinking into this world of sink or swim, high pressure, lots going on, that the traditional management style, the traditional leadership style, the traditional delivery style was going to fail drastically. It was going to fail miserably. And, and I personally was kind of going to be behind that going, uh-oh. Right? So I actually had to lean into this and sort of think, and, we, and, and what, was, what was I going to do differently? And that's my personal reflection. And then, of course, we then brought that back to the organization and sort of created the, the ability for leaders to lean in differently. And so um, it, it was looking at this sort of unicorn, a lot of some, I call it the unicorn of manager, right? The person who knows why and can create the vision, the person that can is the expert about how to do it and then can micromanage the team to get it done, right? Like I think our expectations of leadership need to evolve in this world because if not, we're going to continue to have disempowered employees. And so for me personally, my view on Agile was, was, was clear that the problem needed to go that way. We chose to go that way, and I was kind of thrown in that space. But for me personally, um, I wanted to be a different leader, and, and this was an avenue to do that. And I could still deliver what I needed to through a traditional organization, but by applying these principles really changed who I am from a leadership perspective. And it allowed me to create a lot of trust and empowerment in my team. Uh, and through that, we've seen, a, we've seen great results, obviously, on the outputs from the business, but also from our employee um, satisfaction. And, and so um, it's a never ending journey and I've got a lot to learn, um, but I would not go back. Awesome stuff, thank you. Let me go to Oirat next, please. I, I like the John's comment. I like the John's answers. It is, um, the difference between being agile and doing agile is different. And being agile, it, it's not easy, but once you start exhibiting those behaviors, you don't want to come back. But um, 
answering your question, I don't think we had a choice, to be honest. It, it was, I felt like it was like a necessity. And it's a shame that we haven't adopted um, it, it earlier. We in the industry where prices uh, to our products are dictated by the market conditions. And, um, and it's incredibly difficult to predict the price and build a business plan. So agility is what helps us to adapt uh, to any external threats and most importantly, thrive. And that's why I describe the business agility for us as to win in any environment. Thanks, Arat. And key reasons that the business chose to kind of have a go with Agile for you, Polly. Um, yeah, similar to what Arat was saying, I don't really think we had a choice. You know, it's a competitive landscape out there and the energy market is constantly changing. Um, it is virtually impossible to predict what's going to change next. Nobody could have predicted COVID and nobody could have predicted the market conditions that, as a result of COVID. Uh, and we needed business agility to be able to adapt to it. And I'm so glad that we had started on our agile journey pre-COVID so that we were much better suited to adapt to those change, changing conditions. You know, if we hadn't, then I think that whole process would have been much more difficult for us as an organization. I agree. I agree. We couldn't be living through a more important moment to actually be agile. And the other thing that's interesting is for me is that what we're seeing, even if you hadn't gone through an agile journey up front, is you, you, like you said, you don't really have a choice. And we've been able to respond that, you know, generally the, the world has been able to respond in a really, really agile way um, without necessarily having to. But the question now for me is how do you sustain that, right? We're coming into a world of post COVID normal as Australia likes to like to call it. I'm not sure what that means exactly. But but how are we going to sustain this? And 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 I think that's um, that's the thing that's sort of plaguing on me. If I think about the things that are keeping me up when I think about what's next for our organization, it's how do we how do we really bring that level of of, of agility and maintain it uh, going forward. I don't know, Polly or or if you, your organizations are thinking about something similar or if you if you've worked through that yet. Yeah, we're definitely struggling with the same concept. Yeah. You know, we want to build on all the good things that happened with this pivot during COVID and we want to keep them, but it's really hard not to just flex back into the way that you were used to working. So I think that there's something in between that, you know, as every organization cycles through its maturity, we'll, we'll have to determine what version of that hybrid works for them. Um, but yeah, we're definitely going through those growing pains of figuring out what's going to work for us. Agree, agree. It's a really good segue for our last question of the five that we had, which is kind of like asking, well, what would you keep having experimented with the different flavors of Agile that we've all been through? And the question here is like, what are the key benefits of the new way of working that you can already see having kind of taken the first steps or well, many first steps in, in the world of Agile so far? And maybe I'll go to Polly first. Yeah, so um, my opinion is all of it, just maybe not all together, you know? So I would say similar to what we've kind of already talked about before, we have to be agile in our deployment of agile. You know, we have to pick the parts that work for the parts of our business, um, you know, seamlessly. And we have to pick the parts that will push our business to become even more competitive. That journey of what works where I think is one that Chevron Australia is definitely still going through. We're still trying and we're still working out what the best fit for each kind of application of Agile is. But there's nothing that I would throw out the window. There's no aspect of it that I would be like, nope, definitely not, not applicable anywhere in our business. All right, how about yourself? What would you keep? Yeah, I think I've mentioned the key benefits, but I can share some probably quantitative data. So when we speak about speed of delivery, let's say capital projects, our pilots have completed the evaluation phase in four weeks. Before that, on average, we took about, it took us about a year. Or if we talk about the op, um, ops teams, say um, DNC, uh, they, they did uh, a well planning um, in about three weeks. That usually took them about a year and a half. And that all without compromise, compromising quality. So, but referring back to the main topic of the webinar, the decrease in cycle time has also impacted the costs. Uh, our pilots have shown that on average, we'll be able to reduce the cost down to around 30%. So 
those pilots have been, um, I think, a tipping point uh, for capital projects world. Um, now that all the new projects that come to our small capital portfolio are developed through agile frameworks. We are now in a journey of transforming uh, the entire organization and, and, and adopt agile at scale. And trust me, it's not just you, you come to uh, businesses and say, hey, now you're now agile. It's a, it's, a, it's a marathon, or I would say it's even a three at lot. It's a, it's a difficult process in the journey. But once you start adopting it, you you will you will see the benefits. Uh, you'll see the benefits uh, in the early uh, adoption. So, thank you. Yeah, John, so that's my take. Yeah. So I mean, we, we, so my the group that I work with is called Enterprise Improvement, and we we run the largest cross functional enterprise wide projects for BHP. We. We take them, we cultivate them, we, we frame them, we ultimately deliver them. Now, we deliver them with everyone else in the organization. So by definition, we are, we are pretty much an agile team. Now, we run, like I said, pick and choose the right the routines, methods for the problem that you're solving. So we'll, we'll continue to do that. I think for me, what's, what we're, for me, the, the biggest shift and the one that I hope that we can continue to cultivate in the organization is this, this, this adaptation of leadership. I've probably talked a lot about leadership and culture tonight, but I think it's just so crucial to this being successful, is that the adaptation of leadership from the old command and control to the new empowerment and, and, and agile leadership is, is fundamental for us. And I don't mean agile leadership literally from a hierarchical perspective, but everybody exhibiting those characteristics you want from an organization to be agile, to, to have business agility. And, and, and for me, that looks like you know, managers um, changing their their mantra from command and control or task based orientation to uh, really being you know transferring customer requirements into what the team needs to know, and then letting our principals and highly paid specialists and experts get on with their jobs, right? And and so for me, it's it's continuing to cultivate that 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 agile leadership approach where 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 our people are continuing to be able to be developed. You. you you can't imagine where the great ideas come from. And I've tried to, to you know, figure it out, but you can't, they just come from everywhere. And if you stifle that, that by the way that you run your organization, you'll, you'll struggle. I think that kind of answers the question a bit here in this, in the panel, when we talk about the immunologist method, you know, have predicted a, a pandemic 20 years in advance. How will this method do that? I don't know that it can predict the next COVID-19 or COVID-20, whatever it is next. But what I can tell you is if you deploy this, you'll actually start to listen to people. You actually will start to hear both from your customers and from your people. And you'll have actually a way to raise up those risks formally to, to the organization and actually either address them or put them on the board for the backlog for later. But there is a, there is, when you work this way, there's nowhere to hide. There, and and that's, that's in a very positive sense. There's just nowhere to hide. And you create a very different culture then I can squirrel away at my desk for three weeks and then come back to you and say, well, I didn't really understand. No, it doesn't work that way in, in Agile. Yeah, I want to echo it on. So, sorry, if I may just add very quickly to, to the points from both Oirat and John. Um, in, in terms of, of some of the benefits, I've been told by two senior executives that one of the things they appreciate the most was how Agile enables people to say no or to choose, you know, what, what does actually bad looks like, i.e. the things that you choose to not do, right? And Agile creates a lot of visibility and transparency in terms of what are the things to avoid so that then you achieve more efficiency by focusing only on the stuff that really de delivers value and you get that a lot, lot quicker. So they've told me like, you know, in, in one instance, there was a team form where they were doing uh, investments analysis and they initially in, uh, um, shortlisted like 60 opportunities and they got, got down to eight within the span of six weeks, which was absolutely amazing. So just by eliminating a lot of bad ideas, but doing it really, really quickly actually helped to save them a lot. Thanks, Charles, and thank you so much to Polly, Orat, and John for their wise answers and kind of lived experience from the questions there. Um, we've got a little bit of time left, so I'd like to see if we can field a couple of the questions that have come through from the panel. So, excuse me, from the from the audience here. 
First up, there was a question, I guess, kind of primarily aimed at John, but also I think it's just as applicable to Polly and Ira. <clears throat> yeah, look, we are primarily, we primarily focus the agile routines to our, to our corporate functions. But that said, BHP has, has a, as a, 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 what we call the BHP operating system which is which does look at how our operations function from you know using a lot of the lean sort of Kanban approach. So what I would say is while while I would say I haven't personally taken the agile you know Lego training to to the mind side, the concepts are all very, very much the same. Visualizing the work, setting your your priorities, having the routine cadence in which you're going about executing the work. Um, and then of course your you know your blockers, your your measurables, who's going to take that action. Like it's very, very, very much the same uh, in terms of that. Now, I would say in, in the mind site, m most of these things, and from a, for, for safety reasons, primarily have very strict regimented procedures and are follow what we would want to have as um, non-variable outcomes, right? Because a variable outcome when you're, when you're drilling is not a good idea. <laughs> you want to be very, very, very focused on what your outcome is. People get hurt uh, and, and bad outcomes happen in that situation. Whereas on a, in a corporate function setting, variability is actually positive because you can create value and variability in some places, other places you don't want it. So, but, the, but I think the point there is, is to say that it, it, the concepts in all are very much on the mind side uh, through the BOSS program that we have at BHP, just look a little bit different, feel a little bit different. But again, it, it's the right tool for the right problem uh, to get the right outcome. Thanks, John. How about going to Polly next? controversial opinion, I think that our sites are probably more agile than our offices. Um, they have regular stand-ups, they have very strict cadences, they have a plan and they work to it. They were always better at the fundamental agile concepts than we were in the office. And so, I, yeah, I think it's completely applicable at our operational sites. I actually think that they do it better. Fucking answer. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'd like to echo Polly. Because our early adopters were the folks from projects and operations, as I mentioned, like our uh, uh, drilling and completion team, they use agile in their well planning. Um, we use it in capital world, and when we say capital world, it's a heavily involvement of those folks from operations, and they are part of. Uh, they actually, uh, they actually serve as the product owners for in our capital world, and they're doing a great job there. Not excellent. But doing that, great, and we are as a center of excellence. We're there to help them and support them. That's a great call out from the fact of establishing product owners as the actual customers, which are those on site. Like if you yeah. can, if you can get that, that's the ultimate, right? I mean, they are the true customers. Exactly. I remember having that discussion with you, John, at the uh, back in 2019. Actually, like, who is the customer here? And it's a it's a really good question to ask, especially in a corporate setting. I'll move on to the second question that I've got in the uh, Q and A here, because John, I think you touched on the one that came through from Josh Kinnell in the chat. Um, can we name a concrete business area where agility has helped it be more successful? So maybe just like a worked example in a high level. If you had a, a minute or so to tell a little story there, and then we might wrap up following that. Was that directed to Greg? Was that me? Sorry, let's go with, let's go with Polly first. Um, so we've used Agile probably most successfully in, in like dollar terms in the area of major capital projects. So for those on the call who might not understand what that means, for an oil and gas major capital project that is like uh, building and monetizing, building the facilities to monetize a subsea reservoir, subsurface reservoir. So you've got a pocket of oil or gas out in the middle of the ocean, underground, and we build the facilities to get that gas back to a plant so that we can sell it. Um, we used Agile as a way of working to determine the you know, competitiveness or how much, how expensive is that whole process going to be for a particular project from start to finish. And it was, it was pretty cool. It was pretty interesting. It's probably not really been done at that scale um, here in the Australian business unit anyways. And it was a very interesting pilot program to be a part of. And we managed to establish 35% cost reduction over the course of a four month agile working team focused on that particular activity. Thanks, Polly. I might move on to Aura just next. Yeah, seems very much similar application of agile in, in projects. So we used, we used Scrum in for the early phases and we used Kanban once we know what we need to do to deliver the uh, 
to deliver the product, the, the, uh, the detailed design. But I also mentioned that uh, our, our friends from the Rinkin Completions, they used actually Kanban for their well planning. And uh, that's, I think, the narrow answer where exactly you want to uh, use Agile. Yeah, I guess it's pretty Use Kanban. Nice. Yeah. John, how about yourself? Yeah, so I mean, we, we are running agile concepts to a lot of areas in our organization. You know, now pretty much anything that spins up that has a high priority runs Scrum uh, and runs a sprint approach uh, to, to delivery with high engagement of customers. So a number of examples, one that I might would call out with high success was we actually kind of pointed agile, you know, funding approaches back at technology. So it wasn't actually about it wasn't actually about the technology delivery of the product, but it was about the agile approaches to actually funding those things. So we run a, a project prioritization board which meets quarterly and actually deploys, you know, you know, gives the green light for capital as things are changing. So that's an, exa it's an example of an area where agile principles have been adapted to, a, to an approach to the, that has, been actually, has actually increased throughput you know, quite substantially, more than 50% improvement of technology delivery because we've been able to give better clarity around what the priorities are, kind of what Charles said, stopping the things before they ever get into the system. Uh, and really that runs on a very, very much, very much an agile based principle mindset. You know, we have other work examples, like um, we have a number of digital factories now in our technology or design for BHP that are delivering product-based solutions, you know, to customers in the, in the line working in, in agile or self-sustaining agile teams across the organization. So we have everything from, that to just principle based, you know, we have a problem spin up and we're going to deliver it like when our in our enterprise improvement team. Hey, thank you three for your answers today. I appreciate that um, this discussion could go on for quite a long time um, and as a testimony either to the uh, newfound depths of the subject matter or to my heroic mismanagement of time, we're now over um, the, the allotted time here. So I just want to extend my enormous gratitude on behalf of Adaptivate for yourselves for being part of our panel today and for the attendees who, who made the, the event worthy of sharing. Uh, just a quick note, adapt to partners with organizations to deliver agile transformations globally. You can see by the dots on this map that we've managed to get a lot of places pretty quickly. Um, we work with Fortune 500 companies and startups and obviously people in between as well. Um, and we'd love to hear from anyone who is interested in having a further conversation. Um, in the pack that we will send out later, there's contact details for all of us, um, plus Alex, who is the partner who oversees kind of this area of business. Again, my thanks to Oirach, John and Polly for attending today. And thank you all for making it such a great session. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you all.